I'm here today to talk to you about the arts and specifically what they can add to the toolkit that we use to fix our country's failing schools. I have a lot to say, but first I'd like to ask you to listen to a voice more powerful than mine. talk a little bit more about Jeremy in a moment. But first, I'd like to ask you, in the audience, how did that make you feel? What happened in the room when Jeremy was playing? Can you throw out some words? Happiness. Hopefulness. Hopefulness. So these things, happiness, pride, joy, um, peacefulness, as a matter of fact, these are all things that happen when you bring the arts into a classroom. And not coincidentally, these are also the things that are in very short supply for students in our highest poverty, highest need schools today. Now I grew up going to public school in California at a time when there were lots of arts in schools. I remember being so excited to get my recorder in fourth grade. <laughs> you guys all remember the recorder? I loved to draw and dance and in the fifth grade, I was cast as Mrs. Santa Claus in the school holiday play. Now, I am Jewish, <laughs> and my grandmother was actually pretty upset about this and told me I shouldn't be in the play, to which I responded, but Grandma, it's the lead. <laughs> Sadly, my public education experience is no longer typical. After decades of shrinking budgets and narrowing curriculum and high-stakes testing, Arts education is at an all-time low in many of our cities. Nowadays, in Los Angeles Unified School District, there is one arts teacher for every 2,800 kids. And in high poverty schools, it's even worse. Those schools have no arts. They don't get recorders or school plays or make pinch pots for Mother's Day. So what has replaced these things? Well, I had the opportunity to answer that for myself firsthand. In 2011, the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, where I work, wanted to learn more about what we could do to help struggling schools. So we set out on what may be the least uplifting road trip ever, visiting some of the worst schools in the country. And they were pretty much what you'd expect. Dirty, run-down buildings in bad neighborhoods, schools where less than 20% of the fifth graders could read, teachers who were either so overwhelmed or so demoralized they could barely teach, which explains why teacher turnover is 50% higher in uh, high poverty schools than in more affluent ones. People just don't stick around. There was a school in Bo Boston that had had seven principals in six years. And everywhere we went, there were locked doors and security guards and metal detectors, and still nothing seemed to be working. But there was one school in North Carolina that we heard about that had been getting a lot of attention. It had been a 
terribly performing schools, but test score at school, but test scores had been going up there for the last couple of years. And the principal had a record, track record, of turning around other low performing schools in the area. So we went there excited to see what, what an example of a successful turnaround looked like. Well, that school was clean, it was well organized, and hell yeah, those kids were learning basic reading and math. As a matter of fact, it was pretty much all they were learning. There were endless drills and worksheets and three hour blocks of tutoring for 10 year olds without a break. The classrooms, as we walked through the school, were dark, and the walls were bare, and their windows were covered with fabric. And when I asked why, the principal said, the children learned better without extraneous distraction or stimulation, like daylight, apparently. <laughs> the teachers were using a kind of curriculum, which is very popular in low-performing schools, which is so regimented and prescripted that it's actually referred to as teacher-proof, as in design, so that the teacher can have no impact on the students' learning. And the kids who finished early were rewarded by getting to play a computer game called Study Island that modeled multiple choice test taking skills over and over and over. That island is not a popular tourist destination, by the way. So as we drove away, it was me and uh, my program director, Kathy. Kathy, by the way, is this sunny, positive, petite blonde who's always smiling and always reminding me to see the best in everybody. And we were quiet for a while, and then she says, I just want to punch someone in the face. <laughs> and I was like, what? I literally have never heard her talk like that. And she said, how could all those grown-ups stand around and think that was OK? And that question stuck with me. That school may have been the most joyless place I have ever been. And why do we call that a success for those kids when we would never let our own kids go to that school? So we got to work. In 2012, at, uh, the committee started a program called Turnaround Arts, which brings arts education into a group of the lowest performing elementary and middle schools in the country. We picked a diverse group of schools from a Native American reservation in rural Montana to the Irish Channel in New Orleans to Savoy Elementary, which is right across the river from here in Anacostia, DC. And we brought in art supplies. And we brought in musical instruments. And we recruited famous artists like Chuck Close and Forrest Whitaker and Yo-Yo Ma to visit the schools and make them feel special. We trained their teachers on integrating the arts into math and science and literacy. And we helped the schools hire arts and music teachers. We also took our schools through a strategic planning process to help them target what they were doing in the arts to their larger school challenges. Low parent engagement, plan a student performance night so that parents who only ever get called to the school because their kid is in trouble get invited to see them celebrated. And while they're there, sign them up for parent-teacher conferences. Our school in Des Moines, Iowa did that and attendance at those conferences went up 20% in the first year. Dingy, drab, or sterile school Anacostia, uh, Savoy Elementary in Anacostia launched a Color is Life campaign and brought in students and parents and teachers over the weekends to paint the whole school in vibrant colors. Are you losing your kids in math class after lunch? Help them design a Turkish mosaic to teach them basic principles of geometry. Across the country, our schools were filling up with life, the buzzing classrooms and student artwork in the halls and the sound of bad tuba practice drifting out from the cafeteria. But here's the thing. I could tell you these stories all day long. I could cite you research that shows that when children are engaged in the arts, they are four times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement. They have higher GPAs, higher SAT scores, and they are more likely to both go to and graduate from college. And still, according to the US Department of Education, there are over six million high poverty kids in this country who have no arts or music in their classes. Still, the kids who need it the most are getting it the least. And why is that? Well, everybody says the arts are great, and everybody thinks kids should have them in their schools, but they think they're a luxury. They're something you can only afford after you've solved the school's real problems. But they're wrong. Because the arts are not just a flower, something beautiful to be given to children when we or they can afford it. They're also a wrench, a tool that can be used to help tackle some of a school's most difficult challenges. So I love this metaphor 
But as we like to say in DC, where's the data? We brought in researchers from the University of Chicago's Urban Education Institute and Booz Allen Hamilton to evaluate our turnaround art schools. And they found that over three year, in, uh, in over three years in turnaround arts, school discipline issues plummeted, some by as much as 89%. Attendance went up in half of our schools, and this is the average rate of improvement in their reading and math scores. Almost 23% in math and almost 13% in reading. And then interestingly, they compared our schools to similar turnaround schools in their city or state that were receiving comparable amounts of federal funding. And this is what they found. These yellow schools, these yellow schools are doing, presumably doing everything they can to help improve reading and math scores. And our schools were doing all that while providing their students with a rich, creative, and arts-filled education. And we kicked their butts. You can do both. I have a complicated relationship with this graph. In DC, we live and die by graphs like these. But the picture that it paints is incomplete because we can't just solve for test scores and graduation rates. Children are not cars coming off an assembly line. We've also got to solve for things that you can't measure. Things like creativity, like playfulness and community, like joy. We've also got to solve for this. This is a kindergarten class in Homer, Louisiana, a small rural town where the average income is $12,000 per year. Uh, it's a school that we worked in, and I visited there about a month ago. And that day, the students were learning about uh, an artist who had lost the use of both of his arms, but had learned to paint with his feet. And so the day that I arrived, these children, instead of doing worksheets, were painting butterflies with their feet. That face. That smile. What that little girl says to her mom when she gets home from school, that is also what we need to be solving for. Now before I go, I promise to tell you a little bit about Jeremy. Happily, Jeremy is not a turnaround arts kid. He grew up in a stable and loving family who are actually here with us today, uh, in a good neighborhood, and went to a great public school. And in elementary school, he was gonna be a track star. But he busted up his knee. And going into fifth grade, he was a little lost. He was shy, he was nervous, he didn't know where he fit in. And then he found the viola in his fifth grade orchestra class. His father says it was love at first sight. He said, Jeremy learned about leadership and made new friends, and he learned to finish what he started. Jeremy went on to become first chair in his high school orchestra and somewhat of an internet sensation, arranging pop songs on his viola, and I suggest you all look him up on YouTube. He graduated from high school two weeks ago with a 3.52 and will be going to the Berklee School of Music in the fall. Sadly, most of the kids in our turnaround art schools don't have what Jeremy has. A stable, loving family, people who expect big things from them, a good public school with music and arts to help them find their way. And too often, we, everyone in this room, are the grown-ups standing around thinking that is okay. But it's not. Because these are our kids too. And we should expect no less for them than we expect for the ones that we are raising under our own roof. As a country, we should fund this kind of education. One that provides all children no matter where they live or how much their parents make, the opportunity not only to acquire basic skills, but also to thrive. Because every child deserves to go home with paint between their toes every once in a while. Thank you.